Um, one of the one of the things that, that Tom talked about is um, is the fact that there's this great separation between people in the house, and 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 people should um, know that there is this gray scale, and and indigenous people understand that between human beings and rocks, that it's all a question of degrees. And a house is toward the living end of this scale. Um, the house inhales, the house exhales, the house sweats, the house gets old and starts to sag, and like us, it returns to the earth at some point. You really want to look at the house as a living thing. And the creatures, whether they be us or cockroaches, that live in that house are affected by the same things. And one of the ways that I find it easy to sort of remember all of these interacting things um, is the four elements, which are, which are the four elements. Okay, so all of those elements uh, interact in this house. Anytime you try to fix one thing without understanding how it relates to the other thing, there's a good chance that you're going to create as many problems as you solve. For the most part, our grandparents understood how houses and the environment and the interrelationship with health worked a whole lot better than we do. And to a great extent, that's because houses were basically empty boxes with very few systems. They had a wood stove, a coal stove, and um, that's about it. Um, it was an outhouse. Um, there were very few complex systems. It was very simple. So they needed to understand moisture and heat and humidity and how to keep the dirt out um, and how to keep the water away from it. They needed, they, they were interacting with those things. We, we have the notion that we can put a mechanical system in the house that automatically solves everything. And we can. The problem is, in so doing, we are um, separating ourselves from nature, um, destroying nature, and using up our natural resources at a rate that will cause our grandchildren absolute disaster. And so our behavior has to shift back, and I'm not a Luddite for no reason, to a time when we were more interactive with our environment and more sympathetic with it. And so being able to look at the house as a living thing and being able to maximize the amount of things that we can do with this house um, is, really, is really helpful. It lowers costs. It increases health. Um, it makes the house last longer. With very, very few exceptions, and the one outstanding exception is lead, older houses are far safer and far healthier than newer houses. And that's part because the complex systems don't conflict with each other. So you can scribble notes on it. You can scribble notes. You got two so that you can feel comfortable scribbling away and then maybe scribbling twice. So, sorry, Jim. Okay. So, so the first element I want to look at, and as we talk about these elements, um, I want to really talk about how they interact, is fire. Um, and fire is both a, a, the, the, the most crucial element, that is, there was always, in, in cold climates, whether it was a cave or a teepee or a hogan or whatever the structure was, there was fire. And, and, and that's an element that has historically been critical. And when people put a fire in a building, what's the other thing they always did? If you have a fire in the building, you always have something. What? No, not necessarily. Or at least a hole in the roof. 
There are no indigenous people in the world who put fires in their buildings and don't at least put a hole in the roof, except for now. And what do we do now? We have what? Some very high-end houses where there was a fire, where we put a fire in the house and don't put a hole. Artificial fire. Well, no, um, with, with what? He, how are they run? Um, but that's not a fire, though, right? Oh, okay. So, so the other one is a gas fire or an unvented gas heater or a propane heater. That's putting fire in the house without a hole in the roof. And this is... Um, this is something that only us would ever think of. This is something only the modern mind could conceive of. So, because wherever there's fire, there's going to be combustion gas. And combustion gas rises, and um, when it leaves the house, there needs to be a place where that amount of air comes back into the house. And so, what are the places in this house where there are fire, and we'll go through them one at a time. He's the only one that's not allowed to talk. <laughs> Where's there fire in the house? Gas heater. Okay, so, do we have a problem with this heater? Is there a problem with this heater? It's unvented. If the heater is unvented, it is poisoning you. There is never an exception to that. How about the heaters that's, that they're selling now that say they don't need ventilation? Is there a problem with them? There's no such thing as a safe, unvented fire. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. You've got to get rid of the combustion elements. What's another fire in here? What? The hot water heater. Now, it's hard to see from back here, but the hot water heater looks like... Like that. Now, we got a fire here. And this is on a pipe that goes someplace, right? This feeds into the chimney, okay? Can anybody imagine a problem with this system? Which is what? Um, getting blocked up is a different problem. I'm talking about not the chimney, but I'm talking about this piece right here. There's a gap here. What happens if someone carries a box and this thing winds up looking like that? That happened in Baltimore um, a month ago. Well, what happened? Kill the family. The family died. All they did is they moved this thing one foot. And so all of the gas coming out of here, instead of going up the chimney, filled the house up. They now have units that are, um, that are closed units. That can't happen. So, we want to be really concerned and make sure that this gets to the chimney. If this thing gets moved aside, that's just like getting rid of the chimney because we know that heat rises. It doesn't try to find that. It's going to rise first. What's another fire? There's three more fires here. Four more. Cigarette in the ashtray. Under what circumstances do you smoke in the house? Never, under any circumstances, ever smoke in the house. One of the, we did a, a healthy house program in Baltimore last year. And, and I, was, I was fairly upset when I watched the woman in the house carrying her baby with a cigarello hanging from her lips directly over the baby. We got two different dangers here. Um, but then I was really upset when I went upstairs and saw little black spots around the perimeter of the bed. What were they from? 
What? What, what was happening? She was falling asleep and, and the cigarette was dropping on the carpet, burning the carpet. Okay? Now this is a woman putting herself and her children in enormous jeopardy. And so it means that it is very critical that some way or another, and sometimes it means putting a little hood over the outside and putting a hook over here on the outside for the winter. Why do I want a hook on the outside for the winter? To hang up the coat. Why do I want to leave the coat outside? Yeah, it's full of smoke. You pick the kid up and the kid's inhaling smoke. It absorbs the smoke. So you want to hang your coat outside and you want to never smoke inside. It gets taken outside. Always, no exception. What's another fire? The stove. Okay, assuming it's a gas stove. When you look at an old stove, and you look at the back of the old stove, what do you see? Stoves from 1920, 1930, 35, up 40, 45. What do you see in the back of the stove that you don't see in the new stoves? Anybody? Huh? Uh, tubing. Not necessarily flexible. It's a flat, it's usually, it's a, it's a flat duct. And it rises up from the oven. And what was that attached to? The outside. Because they understood that you don't make a fire in the teepee without a hole in top. They understood that you never, never make a fire without attaching it to the outside. You just don't ever do that. And so all of the old stoves had a vent that came up, particularly from the oven. It rose up and it went outside. Sometimes it would go through the roof, sometimes it would go through the back wall, but it went outside. Under what circumstances do you not need a hood attached to the outside for a gas stove? It's the same answer about smoking indoors. I'll give you a hint. Never. You do not, you do not have a gas fire in a house without attaching it to the outside. There's no exceptions to that. How about the modern ones that uh, have a fan and have a filter and pull it in and then send it back out again? It's gone through a filter. It's okay now, right? Yes, no, no, why not? What's wrong? What it does filter out to some extent is grease. That's a good thing. I'll talk about grease later on. Does it filter out carbon monoxide? That's what kills people is carbon monoxide. Does anybody know what the level is that a carbon monoxide uh, alarm goes off at? It's measured in parts per million. Seventy parts per million, and that's for about an hour. A carbon monoxide alarm is not to warn you of the danger of carbon monoxide. It's to warn you when the danger is so high that it's ready to kill you. But it doesn't warn you at lower levels. And let me tell you something to make you nervous. The Baltimore City Fire Department has a rule. And it says, how many people here know what scuba gear is? Scuba gear is when you have a, a, an oxygen tank. You can go underwater with it. It's what firemen go into a, a building with. They have a mask on that feeds oxygen. So there can be no oxygen available to them and they can still breathe. In Baltimore City, the rule says that if the carbon monoxide levels go above 35 parts per million, they're supposed to put on scuba gear. This kind of makes you nervous. There's evidence that continual exposure to a pregnant woman over a winter's time of very, very low level carbon monoxide, five parts per million, ten parts per million, will result in fetal damage. You cannot allow carbon monoxide to build up in a house. It makes you sick. There was a teacher who actually came from Philadelphia who told me that she could spot the carbon monoxide 
poisoned children when they came into the room. And what are some of the symptoms? She didn't know whether they had headaches or sick to the stomach. That was two symptoms. From looking at them, anybody know? Yeah, it's a drop by. Your, your face gets irregular. Edward Allan Poe had that. Um, everybody heated with gas lamps, remember? They didn't have chimneys. Um, the pace gets, your face gets sort of pasty. Um, um, uh, and, um, um, and then there's, and, and, and people um, doze off. Um, it, 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 uh, it makes you sick. It makes you profoundly sick. And it makes you incapable of functioning in the classroom. And so a, a, a more and more and more we're beginning to realize that asthma problems and carbon monoxide problems and lead paint poisoning problems directly result in a lot of the problems that we have in schools. It is not fair to ask a teacher to deal with an environmental crisis that a child is going through without anybody being able to respond to that crisis. Carbon monoxide in a house poisoned you. Now, when families have a large house like this, and, um, and it's cold out, um, what's one of the things they do to stay warm without heating the whole house? They turn on the oven, and they close the door, and they bring the television set. And now we have two toxic machines, the stove and the television set in the same room. This is a deadly thing to do. I have literally gone into houses and seen four burners in the oven on. And everybody's in there nice and toasty warm. And they're killing themselves. They're literally gassing themselves. And they don't have a vented, they don't have a vent. And so of all of the things, it, in most cases, the solutions for these environmental problems are fairly affordable. This is one of the most expensive solutions there is, but it's critical. And the solution is to put in a stove hood with a fan that blows outside. It's not, you're producing so much smoke and so much steam and so much carbon monoxide that you need a mechanical device to move this outside. It's not enough to let it float up because it's going to float up and the amount that's going to go up the chimney is barely measurable. You need power to take this out. So there's two more fires that we have to be concerned with that profoundly affect the house. One is obvious, the furnace, okay? So the furnace, what's the, what is the, the largest danger with the furnace? What's the thing that, that tends to create problems with the furnace more than anything else as far as health goes? Somebody said it before. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, for yes, if if you have a if you have a gas furnace and the pilot goes out and it doesn't have an automatic shutoff, that would be a case where you're putting uh, that's natural gas. That's not carbon monoxide. That's not a, directly a flame cause thing, but that's absolutely one of the problems. If I go into a house and I tap on this piece of pipe that goes into the chimney and it doesn't sound hollow, do I have a problem? What's the problem? What, what makes it block? What makes it block? Okay, two things. Basically three things make it block. One is something came from above, a bird, a bird's nest, came down there and blocked it, just filled it up. That's number one. Number two, over time, we're looking at houses that are 100 years old. Some of these have a door down here. What's that door for? Right. You open the door and you clean the stuff out. Now, how many houses do you go into that really, where people say, oh, yes, you know, I've, uh, I maintain the clean out every year? Um, almost zero. Okay, and so what happens is that, that this stuff builds up and builds up and builds up. And one of the houses that we went to last summer, when I tapped on that and it didn't sound hollow, I opened it up, and this is the size. This is the size of the um, of the pipe, and this is how much of that was um, open. 
little teeny bit up there. I figured two more winters and they're dead. There was, there was nothing going to stop that. Because remember, this is built up from way below that hole. Most chimneys don't start at the hole. They start below the hole. That means that stuff's been building up and building up, reached the hole and kept going and going and going, and that's all that was left. That was all that was left. Now, you know they had hard carbon monoxide levels, but as soon as that reached the top, that's fatal. They're dead. So it's critical that we are positive that for every single fire that there is a way for the fire to get out. And for fires that don't have a way for that carbon monoxide and those other fumes to get out, we want them out of the house. We don't want them in the house. Either they have a chimney or they're out of the house. It's fairly simple. There's one more fire that profoundly affects us. The sun. So in the summertime, how do we deal with the sun? I know this is an old notion. How do we deal with the sun? What do we do with our house that the sun is heating up? What's one of the ways to uh, cool a house down? Right, close the blinds. I, I um, lived in Tuscany for a month. Tu the part of Tuscany I lived in is pretty much like a big frying pan. It's just blazing sun, unbelievable sun. The houses felt air conditioned. None of them were. They were all very thick walls. They were rooted in the ground. And they all, every single morning in every single house, they closed the shutters. And the shutters were such that it let air flow from below, because there was always um, uh, air coming in below, up through the house and out through the house. And all day long, there was air moving through the house. But no sun got in the house. The houses were virtually dark. As the sun went down and you're in the square, you watch, it's like one of those slow motion pictures of the flower opening. You watched all these shutters opening up in the evening. All over the village, you watched the shutters opening up. This is a natural system. This is a system that they've been using for thousands of years. It works very, very well. And so in the winter, you want as much sun pouring into the house as possible. In the summer, you want as little house as sun as possible. If you have... If you have a situation where it's very moist out here, we, we want to know how the sun affects it when we get into water. We'll talk about that. So, it's an understanding of fire. And we need fire to be comfortable. We need fire to be warm. We need fire for, for light from the sun. Um, but we do not need the products of the fire to spend any more time in the house than they have to and we want to make sure that they all have an exit.